Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session of the Journey Planner. We trust that you are blessed, that you've had a blessed Sabbath day, and that from this evening's presentation, that you will be richly blessed. This evening, we have Brother Kudzai. Good evening, coming, everyone. Coming from Zimbabwe, broadcasting to us from, Brazil, from Zimbabwe, and we're blessed to have him. We're grateful that he could share with us his presentation. This presentation this evening is on self-reliance and performing assets. And before we go further ahead, allow me a moment to just remind you of where we are. So let me just share my screen so that you can see the details of the, the journey planner. So you can follow us. As you can see, we're on the website, thejourneyplanner.co.uk. And there you'll be able to find out more about the aims and objectives of what we've been doing. You can find out who's behind the scenes, making up the rest of the team and previous presentations. You can also find us on Facebook at the Journey Planner SDA, and you'll be able to review past, past, past presentations and Finally, we're also at YouTube. So you'll find us at the Journey Planner 9005, and there you'll be able to find all our previous recordings, our live sessions, and everything else. And so I'd like to take this moment to introduce our speaker, Brother Kudzai. And Brother Kudzai runs a ministry out from Zimbabwe called The Herald Report. And you can find The Herald Report on YouTube, at the Herald Report Ministry, and there you'll see a variety of various presentations covering a wide range of topics on present truth and aspects of Christianity that are essential for us to be ready for when Jesus comes. So without further ado, allow me a moment to offer up a word of prayer, and then I'll allow Brother Kudzai to introduce himself. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, We've come together this evening to continue on another presentation, another testimony, another story of why they moved to the country and what we can benefit from their move, their experiences, from what you've given to them, what you've placed in their hearts to share with us so that we can be informed as to why we need to move, why the move is essential and important. In the, especially in these last closing moments of earth's history. As we go forward, we ask for your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit may be poured out upon our presenter, on myself, and on the hearts of all those who are listening to this presentation, to this broadcast, so that we may know and discern your will and that we will be convicted of the things that we need to do to be in harmony with your will. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. So, Brother Kutsai, would like to hand over the time to you to give us a brief introduction to yourself before you begin your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And good uh, good evening, everyone, and good afternoon to some of us uh, who are still, who still uh, in the afternoon. Uh, my name is Kutsai Chikogora, and uh, I've... Um, we we run a ministry as a family called the Herald Report, as you have seen on our YouTube channel. We, we have been preaching for the past, uh, since 2004, but we opened our YouTube channel in 2019 when we could not travel all over the world. Uh, currently, we are full-time preachers. We run uh, the YouTube channel. We also run a radio ministry, uh, which we do every week, every Sunday from 5 past 9. You, uh, that's uh, 5 past 9. Uh, Zimbabwean time. We also do devotions on uh, on the same radio every day, uh, ten to six in the morning. We'll be do we do devotions. So those are the programs we do. But uh, we also have another big project which we have started doing, and that's great controversy distribution. We have done quite a lot in the prison. We also have done quite a lot in the neighborhood where we live here. We have all, almost finished the neighborhood. And our plan is actually to go to another big neighborhood and distribute great controversy in a very big neighborhood. We are in this place called Mandresa, but next to us is Mandara, and we just want to cover the entire Mandara with the great controversy. 
So that's what we are doing at the moment. And uh, of course, uh, kids go to school and they do a number of things, but uh, we are basically in full-time ministry. Uh, of course, tent making in that, looking after ourselves, doing other things as well, which makes life much easier uh, in this kind of area. Oh, that's, that's great. That's a great introduction. That, that gives us a full understanding of what, what we're about to hear, I believe, it gives us, um, it dampens the appetite or it gets the taste buds um, excited. So, Brother Kutza, I don't think there's anything else that we need to go through or cover. So the time is yours to share your screen and begin your presentation. And obviously, of course, everyone, questions and answers will come as at the end of the Brother Kutza's presentation. And the, the benefit of the question and answers is the fact that there may be things that Brother Kutzai sort of passes over in his presentation, but you may have a question that just brings out the more fully something that is in beneficial to yourself and also to others. So it's important that any question, questions that you have, feel free to send them in via Zoom, or if you're on YouTube, just put them in the chat box and they'll be picked up. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone. Uh, we thank God for this opportunity and we pray and hope that uh, God in his mercy and love you allow us to cover as much as we can and uh, we'll be able to uh, understand the topic for today. I'll just try and share my screen now and then we uh, progress from there. Uh, I think uh, there's uh, there's something that is not allowing me to share my screen, but however, I'm sure I will be able to do that uh, almost there. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's coming. Just through. confirm if you can see my screen. Yep, that's coming through. Thank you very much. So we are going to talk about self-reliance and also we are looking at performing assets, how we can survive, especially in these final days. God has got a different way which is leading all of us, but I pray and hope that uh, we'll be able to benefit something out of this. Shall we pray? Loving Father of mercy and compassion on this special occasion that you have given us, we pray sincerely that you may give us wisdom and inspiration and draw us closer to you. We beseech you in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to uh, uh, focus on a few things as we build on our presentation and I just want to take you slightly to some of the things which we definitely know uh, very well and uh, I want to take you to the quotation that we find in the book Maranatha page uh, two, uh, page 25 paragraph 5 it says uh, the judgments of God are in the land wars and rumors of wars the destruction by fire and flood say clearly that the time of trouble is to increase until the end. That which I want to, uh, to clarify from this statement is that the time of trouble is going to increase until the end. What actually that means is things are not going to get better. We have been in COVID, COVID is over, but however, things are not, get, are not going to get better. As you know, since COVID, things are actually becoming very difficult. I'm very familiar to England because that's where I've lived for 23 years. Things are actually becoming very difficult. And we are told also in lifting up page 356 that the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating their strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes will soon take place in our land. And the final movements will be very, very rapid one. And as these final movements are consolidating, we are told that we enter into the time of trouble, which is going to increase until the end and the events of the book of Daniel chapter 11, especially the final chapter, chapter 11 from verse 40 are going to be fulfilled. Now in Daniel chapter 11, there are quite a lot of things that are mentioned, but the most important thing which you want to focus primarily uh, regarding this presentation is what we find in verse 43, because we are told that the king of the north, we have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. In other words, they will depend upon him. He will control the economy. It is the economy that will be used to control everyone, to ensure that humanity receive the National Sunday Law, the, the National Sunday Law, which is the mark of the beast. 
And Revelation put it nicely. He clarifies it because he said, and he causes all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free, and born to receive in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy nor sell, save him that is a mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it's going to be very hard to survive in whatever condition we are without the mark of the beast if we are not prepared. And one thing I have actually learned is when things are hard, when things have been tightened, there is a need for survival. How are we going to survive? Unless there is thorough planning, we plan, we implement, it will be very, very difficult. When conditions are too difficult, when we, I actually realized during the time of COVID, I was in England, we were in Coversfield, and we actually realized that things were so hard. They were so hard for many people. They were so hard for many of us. But there's one thing I actually realized, because uh, in Coversfield, we lived in the outskirts of this small town called uh, uh, called uh, Bista. And uh, nobody, there was in a very little or very minimal monitoring from our house. You walk into the fields, you walk into the forest. And it was so nice that uh, we actually relaxed. We actually enjoyed ourselves while there was COVID. Of course, I worked as a nurse, so I could go to work. Nothing. There was totally nothing. It's only that uh, we could not do the things that we, we used to do, uh, some of them. But uh, it was actually a good life because uh, of the environment that we're in. Now, so the question is, how are we going to survive? when things become so difficult. The Bible is very clear. Jesus actually talks of the challenges that we're going to face. In Matthew chapter 24, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. He also talks about the time of the end. And he talks about the times of the trouble, which are going to be very serious. But now it calls for preparation. There is physical preparation and the spiritual preparation. And how do you do both? We are told that a great crisis awaits us. That's review in Herald, December 11, 1888. A great crisis awaits the people of God. Very soon, our nation will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as a sacred day. In doing this, they will soon scruple to compel men against the voice of their own conscience to observe the day of nation, uh, nation to observe the day the nation declares to be the Sabbath. So now we will be compelled to work against the conscience. And it is in that nerve that these problems will build up until we come to the book of Daniel chapter 12, when we'll be in serious time of trouble. But however, we are to prepare spiritually, we are to prepare physically, and we are told that our high priest Jesus Christ is in the most holy place to help us to attain the character of perfection as he was perfect. We are also to be perfect. You know, my brothers and sisters, the challenge that you find with men of us sometimes is we concentrate on one area of, uh, of preparation. Some of us will prepare spiritually and we forget to prepare physically. Some of us will prepare physically and we forget to prepare spiritually. But to be fully prepared, we need to prepare holistically. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, it's very important. The moment you focus on one area, you are likely to become a fanatic in that area. But if you look at Christianity in totality, then you will not be misled or, or you will not miss the most important things. So now, how do, how do we become perfect in Christ? We are told uh, uh, in uh, TMK page 354, paragraph 4, it says, uh, this is a devotion. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. So in other words, mentally, Jesus could not yield to the power of temptation. John chapter 14, 30 makes it very clear that uh, the prince of this world has come and he has found nothing in me. It means that all the life of Christ was ordered according to the will of God. He overcome the devil at every step. And we were told that Satan could not find anything in the Son of Man that was associated with him. Therefore, he was in a position where he was totally 
and completely depended upon God. And this is the expectation of God. You know, the truth of God is revealed in our lives step by step. When God reveals something, we follow him. When God reveals something, we progress until we come to a point when we are fully and completely, we have been perfected. We have overcome sin completely. You know, there are two important things that we need to overcome. Spiritually, we need to have victory over appetites and passions. The devil uses these two components to tempt us, appetites and passion. And God wants us to rely on the higher powers, which is reason, intellect, and judgment. And also, we need to prepare physically. And most of the times you find that, you know, when we have prepared, the assumption is that we have prepared spiritually. Because we have prepared spiritually, then we need to move physically. But however, the two can also work together. While we are preparing spiritually, we also prepare physically. You know, Inspiration, Volume 2, Testimony, I say, uh, uh, Selected Messages, Book 2, uh, 3, 5, 2 says, we are to locate ourselves where we will be. We are not to locate ourselves where we will be forced into close relation with those who do not honor God. A crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of Sunday. So our location is very critical. Then we need to position ourselves where we are not going to be forced to do the things that we don't want to do. Why? Because the National Sunday Law is coming. Now, there is something very important, my brothers and sisters. If we believe that Jesus will come in our time, then it's important for us to know that we are going to go through the National Sunday Law. But if we don't believe that Jesus will come in our time, then we may actually say to ourselves, then there may not be any need to prepare as we should, because Jesus may not come in our time. But remember, we are judged by the truth that we have received. The question is, what have you done with the knowledge which God has given you? So now it says, uh, the Sunday party is strengthening itself in its false claims. And this will mean oppression to those who determine to keep the Sabbath of the Lord. You know, I've done quite a number of presentations of the National Sunday Law. And uh, one of, uh, yeah, recently I did one uh, when they were doing the National Sunday Law Day. I did uh, one presentation. You can find them on our channel, the Herald Report Ministry. There is quite about four uh, presentation primarily focusing on the National Sunday Law, the edges in the National Sunday Law, how the National Sunday Law will be implemented, where we are, and what will be happening. So there's quite a number of presentations there. It says, we are to place ourselves where we can carry out the Sabbath commandment in its fullness. So there's chapter 20, verse 9 and 10. And we are to be careful not to place ourselves where it will be hard for ourselves and our children to keep the Sabbath. You know, I've worked in uh, England for a very long time. And one thing which God did with me, I am I'm a trained nurse. In my career, I was working in emergency department. While I was working in emergency department, there is not even one day I went to work on Sabbath. God blessed me with that gift. And when I relate my testimony, some people will say, that's impossible. How did it happen? I had uh, an agreement with God that Lord, I'm going to work on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the morning. But uh, on Sabbath, let me go and do your work. Please give me this rest. And God granted me in emergency department, I did not work on Sabbath. The very day I was told to come and work on Sabbath, they just say, we have put you on the road. It was in Charing Cross the Hospital. I say to my manager, listen, I told you that I can't work on Sabbath. And they say, you have to come, Kuzai. And I say to my manager, I'm not coming. And she said, listen, if you don't come, we're going to have a meeting. And I say, okay, that's fine. But remember, I'm not coming. And you know, I did not come. I did not go to work. And until today, that meeting has never taken place. God bless me with that provision. And uh, I'm ever grateful that, you know, when we have an agreement with God, God will do great things. And then he says, the quotation goes on to say, if in the providence of God, we can secure places away from cities, the Lord will have us do this. 
in the providence of God. If God blesses us with that, let's do that. God can actually bless us with places outside the cities. They are troublous times before us. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, it calls for preparation to be in a place where you will not be forced to work against your conscience. I've left nursing now. I'm now preaching the gospel. Uh, in the preaching of the gospel, we can preach on Sabbath without any problem. But of course, I still work. I still do quite a number of things. I'm not very sure if I will go back to nursing. I'm hoping I'm not going to go back to nursing again. Uh, preaching does good for me. So what I'm saying is that God wants us to secure homes outside the city. If God blesses us with resources, is a, is the best thing. God wants us to be self-employed. Therefore, we can control the time. Let's run our small business. We are becoming self-employed. We produce our goods, especially food. And then we go into entrepreneurship. That will make a big difference if we are to survive the coming crisis. So, you know, when I was in England, in 2002, I got married. In 2003, we had a meeting with this gentleman called Alonzo Smith. Uh, he wa it was not the first meeting I had, or it was not the first discussion. And Alonzo said to us, you need a roof over your head. As that was not enough, in fact, uh, it was a couple's retreat. So the emphasis on that time, it took about 40 minutes. People were talking about property. You need a roof over your head. Let me just mention, at that time, I had finished building my country home. That was in 2002. I had finished building my country home. The first thing which I did as soon as I started working was to build a country home. Before I got married, my father had a farm. My father left a farm for us. So I actually built on that place. I built my country home. But uh, he said, listen, I was now in England. And he said, you need uh, a home. Later on, I had a discussion with my pastor. And my pastor was very busy talking about investing in property. And my pastor said to me, you need a roof over your head. You can't waste money paying rent. You need a roof over your head. So it happens that with my pastor, we had a discussion. He did his first house. He sold it and he bought another one. But he bought a big place. So what he did, he started building another house next to his house. And then he developed that house. And then uh, it happens that he needed some help. And he consulted me. I consulted my wife. And we agreed to help him. We helped him. My pastor developed his home. And then he did more investments in real property. And later on, uh, I managed to secure a flat. Now, I was working at Hillingdon. This was the most interesting thing. There were some janitors who were working during the night. I had a discussion with those people. As I discussed with those people, we started talking about properties. We, talk about, we talked about properties in our home countries. We talked about properties in England. Those guys, they had uh, properties in South. And some of them had two properties. Some of them had three properties. And now, they had, or some of them had finished paying their mortgages, or they were in the process. And later on, they completed. And they had loads of properties. They were not doing big jobs. They were working as janitors, working at night. Their salary was a little fraction to what I was getting. But they were working together. They were advising one another on how to have a better income. So they planned. They did very well. And as they did very well, that gave me an encouragement. So we secured our property in London. And then we, it was a flat. So as we secured a flat in London, we stayed there for about 13 years. And then uh, we decided to move outside London. We wanted to go in the countryside. In fact, uh, when we were moving out of London, we actually wanted to come to Zimbabwe, but we said, no, the conditions are not right. Let's move into uh, England. We took our money from that property. We sold it. God blessed us. In fact, when we bought the property, we didn't have money. We bought the property. We only had about 1,500. I'm not saying you should do what I did, but uh, 
my 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 journey is different, and the way how God led me is different. We had uh, one thousand five hundred. It was enough to pay the lawyers and the searches for the flood. My cousin lended us some money, six thousand pounds deposit. We deposited the flood, and then soon after we we finished uh, the the papers. I took a credit card and I gave to my cousin. And then within a year, I finished the credit. Within, uh, within a year, I paid off that credit card. When we left the property in, uh, in London, going to Oxfordshire, uh, we got over 100,000. We left with over 100,000. And that was the money which we used to deposit our house in, uh, in Coversfield. And then later on, when we moved over here, we disposed that property, we took that money, we invested in different things. And that's, what, uh, that's where we are today. But now, the benefit which I got from that was that the amount which I could not raise, we raised it because all the payments which we did on rentals, we lost, we did not lose even $1. We got everything. And we, 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 we took everything and we invested in other things. And we thank God for the way how he led us. It was such a special thing. But now the question is, how did we survive? Apart from working, there are things that we did which, which in England, which was uh, important. But however, before I talk about that, let me actually talk of the benefits of those who have paid their mortgages in full. When you have paid your mortgage in full, you can actually collect rentals if you have got, if you have done quite a lot of investments, like the porters at Hillingdon Hospitals. They get a lot of money out of that. Some of them, they've relocated to Ghana. Some of them, they've relocated to the Caribbean. Some of them, they've relocated to their countries, and they are still getting this pay which comes to them so they can actually enjoy life. So if God blesses you that you have got a mortgage, you can collect rentals when you are not, uh, and these are tax. This is tax-free money. Uh, you don't necessarily have to pay tax until you, uh, unless there is, you have done something. If you have done a self-assessment, in a self-assessment, that's when you are required to pay tax. But if you don't need a self-assessment, there may not be any reason to pay tax. So real estate is the most ideal thing if God blesses you with it. My pastor was actually advising me. So later on, I actually asked my pastor, say, so pastor, how much have you done? How is your investment? And he said, could I look at this? And then he said, can you see my fingers? That's what I have now. This is in preparation for my retirement. When I cannot work, these properties can just look after me. That's him. I did not go that route myself. I went the other route. In England, we used to sell honey. We used to sell soya milk. My wife used to make some soap and lotion. And we used to sell those things. And right now we are doing the same. Uh, we have done some uh, investments. Uh, we sell soap. She, we sell soap and lotion. And uh, we still sell some honey. Uh, but right now we source honey from other places and we sell. we have got something that keeps us going to ensure that we have got a bit of money. In addition to that, uh, there are places where we go and then we offer our service. I'm going to talk about that shortly. And then we get money from there as well, which has made life much easier. In England, we also used to sell vegetables. We had an allotment in London. When we moved from London, we went to... Uh, Covers food. We had an allotment and we produced a lot of vegetables and we sell those vegetables. And sometimes we also get some fruits from the forest as well, but we did not make money from fruits. We made money from vegetables and honey. That was our main, apart from the jobs that we were doing. But now we are now in Zimbabwe, which is very interesting. I started planning to come and live in Zimbabwe in 1999. The very day I stepped into London, I started planning to come to, in, to, to, to Zimbabwe. So we start, as I told you, the first property which I did, I developed at my, uh, at my father's home. And then later on, we developed a property in the city. And then we developed another property. 
And these two properties are in one place. And so we are, the place where we are at the moment, it's, it's not very big. It's actually a 2,000 square meter. And in these 2,000 square meters, there is enough space to produce a lot of vegetables. We have got quite a lot of fruit trees. So we sell vegetables at times. We have a lot of fruits. Sometimes most of the fruit, sometimes we don't buy fruits. We have got, uh, it, like these days, we've got a lot of uh, avocados. We've got a lot of grenadillas. We've got a lot of lemons. There's quite a lot of oranges. We've got quite a lot of uh, um, sugar cane. We'll not talk of uh, aubergine or eggplant. We'll not talk of uh, lettuce. We'll not talk of spinach, onions, garlic. Uh, these are the things that we produce. One of the things that we've decided to do is that we don't want to buy food. We want to produce our own food. In front of my house, there is almost a hectare of land. And we use that land, that hectare of land. We produce a lot of maize. We also do ground nuts. We also do round nuts. We also do beans. And these things have made a big difference in terms of reducing our expenses. So the bill that I was spending in England, we spend about probably close to 500 pounds on food every month. But here in Zimbabwe, to be honest, we, 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 our, our food budget is less than 100 pounds. 100 pounds a month, it is less. And what makes it less is because we rarely buy vegetables. We produce almost all our vegetables. We eat fruit in their seasons. So when it's time for avocados, we eat a lot of them. When it's time for guavas, we eat a lot of them. When it's time for granadillas, we eat a lot of them. When it's time for sugar cane, we eat quite a lot of them. Not a lot, not very much, but we try to. So we don't worry. And not only that, I did not mention that we also have a lot of, now we've got loads of bananas as well. We produce bananas. We produce ginger. We produce turmeric. We also now have uh, some uh, uh, pepper, which is actually very interesting that we've got quite a lot of those things. Now, there's something that we do at our farm. We also have animals. We have got cows, we have got goats, we have got sheep, we have got chickens. We use, uh, because the people that live there, they milk the cows. Not only that, they use manure for their fields. We sell also our cows, our goats, our sheep. If we want to raise a lot of money to pay big bills, those things, makes a big difference. I was raised by a farmer and my father used to sell his cows regularly, to sell his sheep regularly, to sell his chickens. My mother is at our farm. So we have got these things, our structures are set up. And my mother actually does chicken business. We have done, we do it together. I don't eat chicken. I may have been a vegetarian for a very long time, but my mother has something to do, but we use chicken manure. I was at our farm uh, two days ago and we brought quite a lot of manure. And these are the manures uh, that, this is the manure that we are now using to ensure that uh, we have got good vegetables in our garden. Now, we also do, we produce our own food. We do crop husbandry and we produce our food. As I've said, we do a lot of, right now we've got a lot of maize. We have got a lot of beans as well. We have got a lot of groundnuts. So there's a lot of peanut butter production at our house and we sell that as well. So that actually sustains us. What we've been trying to do is to ensure that we leave uh, this uh, system where we depend upon buying, buying. We rarely buy anything. We rarely buy anything except those things like uh, which are dear to us. Now we produce soap, so we don't buy soap. Uh, we still buy oil because we don't uh, we don't produce oil. We need this uh, some uh, sometimes we need this kind of oil. We produce it. Uh, we 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 don't produce it at home. There's peanut butter, so most of the times rather than using oil, we use peanut butter, and that makes a big difference. So, as I've mentioned, we do market gardening. We produce a lot of fruits, and we sell some of them. We also uh, have, uh, we don't use uh, fertilizers at all, especially here. We don't use fertilizers on our things, on our vegetables. 
we use chicken manure and cow manure, and that has made a difference. So what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, is these are the things which makes life much easier. And when you do those things, it makes life easier for you. You don't necessarily have to depend upon uh, a system. We are trying to get ourselves off the grid. Where I live here, we, we have electricity, but we don't use the electricity. We only use probably about 10% electricity. We produce our own, we've got our solar. So we produce our own electricity. That has made a big difference. In terms of cooking, we use gas. We can also use firewood as well. So that has made a big difference. We don't pay for the water. We have got our own well. So we actually have uh, enough in terms of uh, we produce for ourselves. So that actually makes a big difference as well. Now, there's another thing which is very important. Uh, when you move into the countryside, farming equipment actually makes a big difference. I was talking to my colleagues who are the other side and they were telling me that uh, we are trying to, um, we have been working here, but uh, the process is slow. The reason why the process is slow is because uh, we don't have farm equipment and we want to go and do some work in the city. And then when we get the farm equipment, we come back. That's actually very important. Where we live uh, and where we, uh, where, where we live, people have got cows, but people now prefer to use tractors and people, they don't have tractors. God bless us that when we left England, we left with the tractor. And during the farming season, when we have finished doing our farming, our fields, we actually go and work in other people's fields. And that makes a big difference. It's a massive investment to go and plow. Just to plow a very small place like where we are, uh, they, people, they, they will charge from $40, $40. A very small thing that you can go and do for 20 minutes is $40, that's the standard charge. And then it goes up to about 140 per hectare. So that's, an, that's another way that uh, we use to raise money. That's actually, it's a farming season, it's short. But in that short season, we tend to actually do a lot. And when we have done that, we can actually, once the farming season is over, then we focus on preaching and doing other things. So this is uh, some of the things that we do. But I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, don't expect God to work a miracle for you, for the things that we can do, because he has already given us an opportunity. The reason why many of us fail, it is because we have failed to plan. Because we failed to plan, we would have already planned to fail. And now, Moving from one place to another, you cannot do it overnight. It takes a lot of intense planning of putting resources together. And most of the times I've actually realized that, you know, people move and then they regret, they go back. Most of the times it is simply because you have not planned very well. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter six from verse six, the Bible says, Go to the end, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provided her meat in summer and gathered her food in, her, in the harvest. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? When will thou arise out of thy sleep? Proverbs is saying the children of God are to learn from the ends. The ends plan. The ants work hard during summer. And when they have done what they have done, when the food is plenty, then they can relax. I, I, I've, got, uh, I've got quite a lot of friends here. We share a number of things. And some of the things that we do is to share ideas. Most of them, they've taught me this. There is a time to work very hard. When you have worked very hard, there is a time that you can relax. Let me tell you a bit about this country where I am. In Zimbabwe, on Tuesday, last week Tuesday, I went uh, into the shop. I bought bread for 4,000 Zimbabwean dollars. 4,000 Zimbabwean dollars that day, it was equivalent to one US dollars. And then I left uh, to go to my rural home to see my mother, uh, to eat to our farm. 
when I arrived in the town next to the rural home, bread had gone up. It had gone up quite a lot. Now, when I returned to the city on Thursday, bread was now 12,000 from 4,000 to 12,000. That was actually very clear that things are not balancing here. Money is not working. Money is not working because you, you can't afford to say bread was 4,000 on Tuesday. And when you come to Thursday, bread is now 12,000. You can't eat. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So now I met this gentleman, a close friend of mine. We preached together. And I said to him, so we're talking last night. I said, listen, this doesn't make sense. You can't live in this situation like this. I bought bread for uh, five days ago. It was 4,000. And now you're telling me it's 12,000. How am I going to survive? But you know, the average salary, you're looking at about probably about 300,000. 300,000. So with your 300,000, you buy very few loaves of bread. How are you going to get food to put on the table? How are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to pay your bills? So life is unmanageable in the city if you are not prepared. That's, you know, God has actually taught me this lesson, but now I have proved it. I'm, I've been told this before, but now I've proved that things can change so quick. So the children of God, while they have time, they need to ensure that they put structures in place. So my friend was saying to me, listen, when this situation happened in 2008, we went to Botswana, we bought our bread maker, and we bought our flour and we produce our bread. Because with that kind of situation, you can't buy bread. Now we talked quite a lot of things and what he was saying to me is this, listen, in this kind of situation, what you need to do is to produce your own food. And one thing I've done is uh, I've been working hard. I've been planning, not only me, but many people around me here, they plan to produce their food. They've got their farms, they've got their small piece of land, they produce their food to make life much easier. So while they have plenty of things, while they make money, they invest in the things We ensure that while money cannot be made anymore, they can feed on those things. Indeed, there are times that will make a lot of money in England. We make a lot of money. But now that time is not there would try by all means to survive on the investments that we have done. Though they are small, but God is faithful. You know, I've learned something. The psalmist says, I've been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging bread. If there is one thing that I've never missed is food. There's always plenty of food because God provides. So what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, is that it is our personal responsibility to plan. It is our personal responsibility to work. It is our personal responsibility to develop the talents that we have so that we can become useful and we'll be able to put food on our table. These are the things that we are to do because God has already given us that provision. Let's not wait for God to do it for us because God is not going to do it for us. Now. CG, page 156, paragraph one says, so far as possible, every child should be trained to self-reliance. Every child should be trained to self-reliance. The question that you need to ask yourself is, who is going to train children to be self-reliant when parents are not self-reliant? I thank God for my father because my father was a teacher. As he was a teacher, my father left teaching very early. He bought a farm, and then he was at his farm. My father was, uh, he was a counselor uh, for the area. Not only that, he did quite a lot of farming projects. One of the things that he, he used to do was to train farmers on how to farm. So I was raised into farming. My farming is from my background, from my father. So <laughs> I can do farming. I can wake up to do farming. These are the things which my father trained to do. And I, 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 I'm so glad that my father taught us to do farming. But there was one thing which is very important. If you go to the last paragraph, no, last sentence, it says, 
A wise instructor will give special attention to the development of the weaker traits that the child may form a well-balanced, harmonious character. So apart from farming, my father also did send us to school. He valued education. So the two of them, we did together. Before we go to school, we go for farming. But later on, we go to the boarding school. We went to the Adv I went to the Adventist boarding school. And one of the things that we did at the Adventist boarding school was farming. So we do a lot of farming to produce our food. So from that age, I understood that food is not from pick and pay or from Tesco. Food is from the field. And when you eat from the field, your food is good, your food is palatable, your food is cheaper, and you have got loads of it, you eat without reservation. I grew up at a farm where we worked very hard. So if there's one thing that we do, we eat a lot of food, there's plenty of it because we produce it. So what I'm saying is those are important lessons. If we are going to educate our children, we need to educate them to be self-reliant, where they can master a skill. And the skill which I mastered from my father was farming. And that's the skill I have today. Now it says, uh, uh, Fundamentals of Education, page 72, every institution of learning should make provision for the study and practice of agriculture and the mechanic and the mechanic arts. You know, there's only one industry that you find in the Bible, and that's farming. There's only one industry which God created, and that's farming, so that we can produce our food. Now, there are lots of things which our children can do, and there are lots of things which, can, uh, which our children uh, can pursue. The industry is big, but the most important thing is if our children can learn the industry where they can employ themselves, if you cannot employ yourself, then you are in serious problem. You remain a slave for the rest of your life. I was actually trying to wonder why would my father leave teaching and go and do farming? Because at that point, teaching was a very good job. My father was a headmaster. He left teaching at the height of his career. And why was he doing that? He actually realized that there was something more better in farming. Now. Let's actually talk a bit about this industry, uh, these courses. Our children, we can encourage them to do farming because when they do farming, they can employ themselves. One of the best jobs or one of the best industries in the world is farming. With farming, you feed the world. You never go wrong. One of the things that we can do is real estate management. You never go wrong with property. If God blesses you that you have got capacity, you have used your brains, you never go wrong. One of the areas which I've actually realized, which has actually developed so well, my, I've got my brother, my old brother. He was going to, uh, to some learning. He went to America to do some education. And then later on, he discussed with my other brother. My other brother said to him, listen, don't come back before you have done some computers. Do some computers. And my brother ended up doing uh, computers. Now he's, uh, he's, a, he's a computer engineer. And that has made a big difference in his life. There are things like engineering, things like mechanics, things like building, things like electronics, electrician. These things will make a big difference so that you can be self-employed. Now, you know very well, the people in England who are paid well, the plumbers, they get good money. Simple things, you control your time. You just work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you've got enough salary for two weeks. The mechanics, they make good money. People who have done computer science, they do very well. And there's something very interesting about computer science. You don't necessarily have to go to university. These courses are self-taught. You know, my son is a friend to one of the gentlemen who taught himself to do computers. My son is 16 now. So this young man who taught himself to do computers, he did computer programming teaching himself. And then he got a job. He got a first job where he was getting about um, less than 12,000 uh, pounds a month. And then he got the second job where he was getting about 25,000 a month. 
And then he actually becomes self-employed and he was getting about 50,000 a month. And now he's running a very big company, a very big company where he's getting way over 150,000 a year. He doesn't have a degree. He taught himself to do computers. And that's what he is doing. What am I saying, my brothers and sisters? I am saying God has given us brains. And God has given us skills. When we use those skills, we can do wonders. It is not the desire of God that we can be employed, employed by someone. The desire of God is to employ ourselves and do our things. You know, one of the things which I, I did, uh, I, I preached the gospel. Since 2019, we started preaching. That's when we opened our channel. Uh, I've got a brother I've worked with before, and we still work together. Uh, brother Wayne, uh, he said to me, Brother Kuzai, listen, you preach, I take videos. That was Brother Wayne. I thank God for that brother. So I started preaching. So he did just one or two videos. And then uh, I, I would travel. He goes to a different church. So that didn't work out well. So he gave me a camera. And then my son started using the camera. I said, you do this, you do this. I was teaching him. But now, after a few months, my children mastered the art of camera. They mastered it so well, and they will do it so well. So we started developing our machinery. One by one, we buy this, we buy this, we buy this. And then we come to a point that, you know, Brother Wayne could not cope up with the speed of editing. But we needed somebody who can edit. He's not a professional editor. He was just learning. And then we got this professional editor. He was editing for us. And then he said, per video, I would want 30 US dollars. He was in South Africa. He want 30 US dollars because we just transferred the files. And uh, we did the first one and we did the second one. He said, that's unsustainable. It doesn't help. It doesn't make, it doesn't help us. My son, at that time he was 13 going to 14. He just looked at the iMovie. He just looked at the program and said, no, I can do it, daddy. He said, can you? I can do it. And then he started doing it from that very day. We have produced more than 360 videos. They are all edited in the house. And my son is now 16. Uh, the other one is now uh, 12. They just do these things. Easy, easy. We just do these things. God has blessed us to have this opportunity where we can do these things ourselves. And that has saved us a very huge bill. But I want to end by talking, uh, 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 I want to end uh, on this note. Bible commentary page 11. In fact, before I go there, I want to take you back to uh, to this uh, scripture, which is in, uh, how I, uh, let me just see if I can actually, uh, something is not working well here. Let me see if I can. Uh, right, I want to take you to this scripture. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, 14, because everyone is different. The Bible says, for the kingdom of heaven is like, is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to one he gave five, to another two, to another one, everyone according to his several abilities. And then he took his journey. People are gifted differently. One of the things that you need to do is to identify your gift and to use your gift. God will help you to develop your gift and your gift can actually look after you. As I've said, I've actually realized that uh, my son can actually work on computers very well. And that has actually helped us in the preaching of the gospel. I'm good in farming. And... Uh, when, I, uh, when we are in the farm or when we are working in the garden with my wife, I've got a certain way of doing it. It's in me. And my wife always say, others have it and others don't have it. And I've actually accepted that others can do it better than you. But of course, you know, with every gift, if you have got one, you use that one, they become two. You use those two, they become four. You use those four, they become eight. You use those eight, they become 16. The children of God can do anything. God can help them as long as it is useful. God can help them to do those things. Christ's object lesson, page three, uh, three zero, as we conclude, it says, God will accept only those who are determined to aim high. 
we are, should determine to aim very high. He places every agent under obligation to do his best. Moral perfection is required of all. Never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate or inherit inherited or cultivated tendencies of wrongdoing. We need to understand that imperfection of character is sin. So we need to develop ourselves spiritually. We need to develop ourselves to the highest standard. Physically, we should do the same. Morally, in everything, God expects perfect, perfection. And then he says, all righteousness attributes of character dwell in God as a perfect, harmonious whole, and everyone who received Christ as a personal savior is privileged to possess these attributes. What am I saying, my brothers and sisters? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says, whatsoever we find, we should do it diligently. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, whatsoever we do, with, uh, we should do it with all our hearts. This is the expectation of God. So what then should I do? Before you make a move, before you do everything, consider the word of God. God wants us to spread all our plans before him. This is our final quotation. Spread every plan before God with fasting and with the humbling of the soul before the Lord. Jesus, uh, the Lord Jesus, and commit thy ways unto the Lord. The sure promise is he will direct thy path. He, will inf he is in fight in infinite in resources. The Holy One of Israel who calls the host of heaven by name and holds the stars of heaven in position has you individually in his keeping. Now listen, God is you individually in his keeping. As long as we spread our plans before God, God will do that which only God alone can do. When we left Coversfield, one of the things that we prayed for was to begin a radio ministry in Zimbabwe. As we prayed for this project, I left Coversfield with about 2,500 pounds. This was to begin the radio ministry. So, as we came to, as we arrived in Zimbabwe, I took the 2,500 pounds. I developed a studio. And then we work with some global pioneers. We work with some conferences. We send some money to the global pioneers. I remained without any money. So that dream of radio ministry died. And then, uh, but we had prayed for it and we we're sure that we we're going to do it but now there was no money. So I met this gentleman who said to me, he listened to me preaching four times. And then he said, listen, come and see me. I went to talk to him. And then he said, listen, let's do a radio ministry. I will pay. And then you preach. And I said, oh, praise God. So he paid the first month. He paid the second month. He paid the third month. And then later on, he said, I, I don't have money this month. God did a miracle. We were to pay for the program. We found money somewhere. We paid. And it happened that the next month he didn't have money. We found money somewhere. We paid. And then the next month there was no money. We found money. We paid. And then later on he actually managed to get some money. But there was no money the next month. We have been paying until today we are paying. We are left with only two months to finish this program. The program cost us about 1,500 a month. It's an international, it's a national program on the national radio. God has been good. The project that I didn't have money to pay, God provided money. You know, these are the miracles which if I begin to tell people, people will not agree. They say, no, you are joking. How is that happening? But you know, it's, it's something very interesting that God is actually allowing us to get enough money to pay. So far, we have paid for the month of uh, May, May and June. And you know, surprisingly, we paid for the month of June while we were in May. We paid together for the month of May and June. Now we're left with to pay for the month of July and August and the program will end. We have developed friendship. 
with the people of ZBC. As we have developed a friendship, they have actually requested that I do their devotions. So now we don't pay for doing devotions. This is a thing, it's now a project that we do. They look forward that every morning I send them a devotion. And this is an opportunity to, to, to preach nationally. If there's something which I can say is, God has led us beyond our understanding. Now we are coming to the end of our program, but we're not going to end. We are now praying for a new project that we are hoping that God will help us to do this project. And while we are doing that, our prayer and hope is one day we are going to conduct our programs while we are at our farm. We are busy developing it in a way that we can actually conduct the same programs that we are conducting in the capital. We can conduct them while we are at our farm far away from the capital because now all things are possible one of the things which are, which is a difficult uh, which is difficult is internet because there is no good internet but however on our next door our neighbors the school next to us now has a wi-fi so we can actually also have an opportunity for a wi-fi so we have seen the providence of god slowly but surely but god is leading so let me end by taking you back to the quotation which I've read, which I said, spread everything before God. Cooperate with God. God will lead you step by step and you achieve the things that you endeavor to achieve. As long as you are cooperating with God, God will do what only God and God alone can do. You know, if I will tell you how God has led us, the miracles that we have seen along the way, it's beyond our understanding. But one thing which I can safely say when I'm talking to people is that God has put his favor in what we are doing. And God has approved what we are doing. And we are seeing God at every step. And all we can say is God is able to lead everyone. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We are different. We think differently. We look at things differently. But you are taking us step by step. Give us grace to cooperate with you, to prepare physically, to prepare spiritually as we wait for your soon return. Bless us, we beseech you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Kutsai, for sharing the presentation this evening that is very uh, informative presentation on the things that stood out to me was the importance of the balance, the holistic approach to preparation for the final crisis, not just looking at just the spiritual and neglecting the physical or focus on the physical and neglecting the spiritual and just having that whole balance. If we have the whole balance, we can't go wrong. And then the other thing that stood out was the importance of planning the need that, that we can't have success if we fail to plan, that things, things just won't go right if we don't plan. And then once we've planned, spread those plans before God with prayer and fasting. So it, that was a very, 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 very um, much needed presentation, I believe. The, the utilizing of what, we, what God has blessed us with and how we can utilize those things so that we don't go out to the country and continue living like we do in the city, where we're slaves to the same master, but in a country location. So, Brethren, I trust that you have been blessed by the presentation from Brother Kudzai. Now is the time to ask your questions, raise, share your comments. Um, if you wish to verbalize, please do raise your hand so that you can be unmuted if you wish to raise your comment verbally or your question verbally. Um, we've got a question here from someone asking, from Millie, asking if you can show some of your plantations, please. So I'm not sure if you have any pictures available to hand that you can quickly share what the farm, the land that you're utilizing in the country looks like. 
Uh, I, I did not uh, do that. I did not plan this on this presentation. I've started using this computer today. I'm not sure how to go through, but however, tomorrow we are uploading a video on our agriculture, on our, uh, our video that shows what we have planted and how, what things are. So you can actually get the video if you go on the Herald Report Ministry. Tomorrow we are actually uploading that video, which actually shows our cur the current state of our plant, uh, our crop the our vegetables and also our animals as well uh, i know some yeah, and our animals as well so you can go to the herald report youtube channel tomorrow in the evening and that video will be there yep i've put a link in the the the, the, the chat box the zoom chat box for the link to the youtube channel the herald ministry the herald report ministry so you can see what's going on there i've also seen one of your previous country living presentations and of some video you've done of what you've planted and what you're growing. So you can also find that on your YouTube channel. I think it was last year, it could have been. So th there's, a, there's a lot of information you can, um, if you wanted to see the, um, what the land looks like that Brother Kutsai is utilizing. Um, Brother Kutsai, it seems that planning was, fundamental to where you are now the fact that you left Zimbabwe and as soon as you arrived in the UK you were developing plans to go back home and it wasn't a matter of what did that plan in include also the time that you would stay in the UK or just what you would do when you get back home yeah when I arrived in UK in 1999 the plan was that I will stay in the UK for 10 years. So after 10 years, I not finished studying. I was doing uh, public health. So I, I had to extend time. So I extended time until uh, I had finished. So now uh, after I had finished uh, in 2010, I was now planning to go. But however, it was not time yet for me to go. So we stayed and stayed until we came to 2019. Uh, in 2019, this is when I was saying to God, I don't have any plan anymore in the UK. What I was meant to do here, I have finished. Is there anything left? That's when God actually say, it's now time to move. There were quite a lot of things that happened. As I've said, there was a lot of prayer and fasting which was actually a clear indication for me now, this is now time for you to move. At this juncture, there is something better that you need to go and do. So therefore move now. And I was actually very much convinced that at that time, I can actually move. By that time, I had done quite a lot of developments as well, which was actually making life much easier. So whenever I will be paid, I was investing probably 20% of my salary was being invested in Zimbabwe every month. 20% of my salary I will invest in Zimbabwe every month to ensure that at least when I come to Harare, I have a safe landing. I will not miss the lifestyle I had in England. Mm -hmm. I see. And am I, if, if, if I'm reading things correctly, the plan to come, to come to the UK was a plan. It wasn't just a whimsical thing. You didn't just come here because there was an opportunity to come here. You had planned to come to the UK to utilize the resources here before coming back home, right? Correct. I had a plan. I planned to, to, to go to England because there was an opportunity to go to school. So I planned. I was working. I worked for myself. For six months, I was working in preparation. Nobody gave me money. I was, at that time I was 21, I worked for myself and then I raised the money to go to England. The moment I arrived in England, three days into England, I actually started working until the day I left England. But wow. indeed, definitely there was some planning. I planned. That's why I arrived in England within three months, within four months of my arrival in England, I started fencing my father's farm. And then after that, after a little while, I started building because the intention was that I am going back. I'm not here to stay. I'm here to live. But of course, 
God had a plan that, you know, when we're in England, we are going to preach the gospel. And then after we have preached the gospel, we will also preach to other distant lands. So where did the, the significance of planning, how did you get introduced to the importance of planning? You know, these are the things that I grew up with. My brother, uh, the brother that looked after me, I've told you of my father with the farm, but I had another brother. My brother was a magistrate. My brother sat down with me one day and he said, as soon as you start working, you need land. You need to plan. So my brother planned his, his life in such a way that uh, as he was retiring, my father had secured his 12 hectares plot, 12 hectare plot in the, in the, in the city. And they had other four plots in another city. And they had loads of land somewhere. So this was something which I actually learned from my brother that, listen, planning is central. And my brother was saying to me, you know what? I did not pay much for this. I paid very little. I had a discussion with these work people I was working with and actually advised me the importance of planning. And I, as I, that was my brother. But as I've said to you, the meeting with uh, Pastor Alonzo Smith, made a big difference when he was saying, listen, plan for your life, plan for retirement. We are foreigners in this land. We need to plan because this land is not ours. And if we don't plan well, we actually make life very difficult. And examples were given to our Caribbean friends that they, they will spend six months in England and they will go to the Caribbean six months. They had planned their life. They had land over there. And also they had, they had some land, some, some, some houses or flats in England. That was, actually, uh, that was actually a very good ground for me. It actually helped me to realize that, you know, if I don't plan, I'm actually in problems. Mm -hmm. Not only that, there is something in my mind something which told me that there is time for everything. There is a time that I can work, a time that I will not be able to work. And for that reason, if I don't put things together, I'll come to a point where I cannot sustain myself. Therefore, planning is central. I'm still planning. I'm still implementing. But definitely, that's the journey which God has taken me. Mm, I see. And when did country living, country living has always been a part of the plan or was that something that came about after arriving in the UK in that, that session you had with Pastor Alonso? You know, I was raised at a farm. Ah. So country living is the lifestyle I grew up in. But when I came to the city, I stayed with it. First, I stayed there. My first time to enter into the city on my own was in 1992. I visited my brother who was living in a... Uh, in, uh, in the central part of uh, Zimbabwe called Gweru. I looked at the way how he was living and uh, I didn't like it. And then I actually stayed with my brother in another part of Harare. I sort of liked the way how he stayed. But then I started comparing the two. And I actually realized that no, my father has a better life at the farm. So it has always been my prayer and it has always been in my mind that, listen, country living is much better than city life. So as we studied the books of Ellen White, as we look at what was happening, I actually, and also I realized that most of the guys, especially here in Harare, they work in the city, but most of them have got farms. So every weekend they go to their farms. They will leave Harare, they go to their farms. And now later on during COVID, I actually realized that, especially in the northern suburbs, the city was almost empty. People who go and live at their farms. I actually realized that the lifestyle, which is best, is actually at the farm. Whenever people retire, they go to their farms. So city life has never been the ideal for the children of God, but country life is the best. So it is my background that influenced me and also my association with people who enjoyed country living. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I see. And how much would you say that through God's providence, he caused you to um, connect with the right sort of people that would stimulate your thinking in the right sort of way? That if you, if the same, if, if you were to do it all over again and you didn't have, say, 
the, the people who made the right sort of stimulants, would you have made the, would things be the way they were? Or would you have still journeyed the way you journeyed and planned the way you, you know planned? Something, you know something very interesting? I had two types of friends. All along, I had two types of friends. Right. Some will tell you that, you know what, you don't need to move out of the city. This is the best. And some will say to me that, you know what, to move out is the best. Now, so when I relocate from England, when I relocated from England, I had people who say to me, this is the worst mistake you have ever made to leave England. And then I have people who say to me, this is the best that you have done, not only for yourself, especially for your children. This is the best that you have done. So now I had, to, I had the choice to make because I've got both friends who will tell me that you are doing a serious mistake and some will tell me you are doing the best mistake. So at every given time, I'll go to God and I say, what do you want me to do, Lord? Now show me what to do. I was convinced, not by friends, I was convinced by God on what to do. And I 100% know for sure that we cooperated together with God. And every step of the way, God has confirmed the actions. In fact, God has been leading the action. That's why I say sometimes, you know, when I begin to tell people of how God has been leading me, they say, you are lying. And some people will say, you don't, you don't believe you. And some people will say, no, you are mad. But to be honest, God <laughs> has been leading me throughout in a way which many people say, ha, but is this what is happening? This is exactly what is happening. God has been opening some doors. And God will close some doors. There are times that I will think that God has opened this door. And God will prove to me that that door has an opportunity to open, but it's not the best for you. Therefore, I'll close it. And then God will say to me, that's the best door for you. I've opened that one. Go through that door. When I go through that door, I actually realize that's the best and I continue to move. So as I've said, prayer <laughs> has been my guide and God has confirmed everything through prayer. You know, if there is a place that transformed me, it was Coversfield. I lived in that place in Bista called Cuttersfield. And I'll wake up in the, during the night and I'll go in the forest to pray. Sometimes I'll wake up at two and I'll go and I'll spend time in the forest together with God. And I will leave the place of prayer when I had an answer. If there was a time in my life where prayer made a difference, where I actually realized that God can have a conversation with me, it was in Coversfield. And that place transformed me completely. That's why I'm talking as I'm talking today. Wow. Praise God. This is a very um, encouraging presentation. And yeah, just the importance of prayer and planning and making sure that you put those plans before God. And just trust in him. The, the, the other point I found very interesting was the um, the utilization of the talents and working in the learning the skills of industries that you can employ yourself in rather than being an employee employer. So that's that's mm -hmm. also a very interesting point a, approach as well. And also the fact that the 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 experience you highlighted with the janitors in the hospital that you would expect would be on, on, even though they're on minimum wage, would be just, that's it, just doing nothing. But these guys have properties and they're utilizing their properties. Therefore, they don't need to be chained to a desk, working nine to five or even longer hours, 100 hour weeks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. They, they've got their, their income coming from something else. So yeah. what advice do you have to give us if we've been how, how how would we transition go about best best to transition away from the mindset that we have of going out to work and looking always to get the pay rise from the job and to be continuously bound by the job because they dangle a slightly bigger carrot which just gets eroded by the inflation that you talked about going from one part of the country to the next part and the price increases in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, there's one thing I've learned. Yeah. If you fear, you're not going to do anything. If you fear. The situation that is in Zimbabwe at the moment, it has happened before. This situation happened in 2008 when I was in England. I arrived in, in Zimbabwe when things were so hard and I saw what was happening. So when I was leaving England, many people will say to me, where are you going to get money? Things are hard there. How are you going to survive? But I say to myself, if God led the Israelites through the desert and God provided for the Israelites, will he not be able to provide for me? Especially if he is leading me. If God is not leading me, I have all the reasons to worry. But if this is the leadership of God, I have nothing to worry at all. He will supply all my need according to his riches and glory. And definitely, God has not disappointed me so far. Not even an inch. Maybe. The other thing which is very important is, because it takes a long to plan, listening to the experiences of people is very critical and central. Especially when people, if, if they are old people, elderly people, when they are talking, listening to their experience, you take that which is good and you leave that which is not good for you. And at every given point of my life, I've actually realized that that has made a huge difference. Be it in the ministry, in the preaching of the gospel, listen to the experience. Be it at work, listen to the experience. When you listen to the experience, it makes a big, big, big difference. If there's one thing, there's one thing which uh, God revealed something to me. I was working with this lady in Hillingdon Hospital. That was in uh, 2000. No, that was in, 19, in 2001. In 2001, there was a lady called Lisa. Lisa Rally. That I will never forget that lady. She said to me, I had an experience my father told me, if you want to buy something, make sure that you have enough cash. Don't get yourself into debt. So I don't get, any, I don't take any debt. I pay my things cash and I have no problem. That was a very good advice. I did not listen to it though. It did make, it did not make any sense to me. But later on, I realized that had I listened to Lisa Raleigh, it would have been a very, very big thing as well. So I'm coming to this point. Many of us today, we are trapped in the system of uh, first world. The system of the first world is debt. We acquire on debt. We live on false money. We live on fantasy. We think we, 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 we afford things which we do not afford. And when it comes to the place where we try to move, we are not able to move because we are trapped. So this actually takes a long time where you realize that, you know what, the word of God is true. The moment you decide to be a borrower, you become a slave. God wants us to free, to free ourselves from this slavery system. You know, when we started doing a honey business in England, the money will not come all of it one time. But sometimes we get $100 a week, a month. Sometimes we get 300, 300 pounds a month. And that money made a big difference, small amounts, but very good. Here in Zimbabwe, the business which my wife is doing, it's not a very big business of selling soap. Sometimes she'll go, she'll sell, and she'll get about $20 a day. And when we go and do our tractor business, sometimes we can get $50 a day. On a good day, sometimes we can even get $300. It doesn't come every day, but it comes. But there's something very important. That money is tax-free. That money, we have worked for it. That money can accumulate. And we are not in any debt for that reason. Life is actually much better. You sleep and you don't think where will money come from. Neither will we think where are we going to get money to pay rent. God has allowed us to plan for that and God has blessed. So what is my point? My point is this. Let's plan. 
let's not fear to invest, but in our investment, let's do a tried and tested investment. Something which we know that, you know, this is tangible. We are not putting ourselves in a situation where we cannot handle, where we can actually, when, when it becomes that very difficult. Do you know, I listened to a sermon from C.D. Brooks and C.D. Brooks said, you know, if you are going to buy a house and then you pay more than half of your salary to the, to the house, you are making a serious mistake. You need only to pay a quarter of your salary when you are buying a house. This was the sermon from C.D. Brooks, and he was telling us that, you know what, you don't need to, be a, don't have to be a slave or if, of even your mortgage. Make sure that you are doing things that you can afford. And in that situation, you are able to maneuver easily. But if you are in a situation where, let me actually say that, you know, one of the things which you realize, you know, especially nurses, Agents, nurses, they have a serious problem. They think they have a lot of money. Let me because ask. when they work, they, they get a lot of money every time. And then because they think they have a lot of money, they put themselves in serious debt. And then if they fail to get a shift, they complain so much because they are in serious problem. The problem is that they fail to realize that they don't have a lot of money. They have very little. And they also need to do some things with their time. Therefore, now they, they, they invest so much of their time in working and they miss on important things. That's why self-employment is very critical. Budget your time. I work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I've got Thursday with my children. I've got Friday to prepare for the Sabbath. I've got Sabbath with the family. I'm now managing my time. So let me summarize it this way. Plan, invest, Trust in God, God will see you through. Amen. Amen. That's powerful. Uh, we're coming to the end of our broadcast, but one final question I'd like to ask is if you could give us some comments on is it too late? For those of us, for, the, for those of us that are young, we have opportunity to make right steps going forward. But for those of us that are close to the evening of our years, is it too late? <laughs> you know that's a very good question my brother i was talking to this gentleman and uh, he was uh planning to move to the countryside and i said to him spread every plans before god and seriously consider some things going to the countryside it's not running away from anything you are going to an environment where it's conducive where you can do your things easily. But remember, you may not have an opportunity to do that because you cannot afford. Going to the countryside, it's not easy. There is hard working. It's hard to be on a farm. Let me say to you, it's hard to be on a farm. I grew up in that lifestyle. It takes a long in the planning. Therefore, understand this. While you can prepare physically, prepare spiritually. When you have done the best spiritually, God will do the rest physically. Amen. You don't have to put yourself in a situation where you are now, you can't manage anything. You start regretting. You go back to the city running. That's what many people will do. They go back to the city running because they've left it, number one. Yes, they've left it too late. But however, the knowledge has not come until in the evening of their life. God is merciful and is kind, and he knows how to deal with us. But while we are still young, if we can do it, and God opens the way, let's do that. But do not follow anyone. Let God convince you, convict you, direct you. You cooperate with him, and you see how God will do. Amen. God Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've got a question coming, here through, coming through here, asking if... Um, if you pray with your children and if you include your children in your plans and your prayers and talks with God, how do you include not only your children, but the whole family, I guess, now that you have that? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I prayed with my children. I, in everything, this was done as a family. This was done as a family. I would talk to my wife. We would talk together. We agree. And then we agree on the roadmap that we are going to do this. And then we do that. 
we do that, and then we follow in that process according to the family. And to the children, we, we talk to our children, we help them to understand the importance of better schools. We help them to understand the importance of spiritual education. One of the things which actually drove us, that has made us to be where we are, it was the education of our children. We wanted the best education and the best education is spiritual education where they learn not only theoretical, but also practical, where they learn the word of God. So this was key. We we God helping us, we discussed, they were convinced, and they actually realized the benefit. Now everyone is happy. Everyone. When I say everyone, I mean the whole family is happy. We are very content. When the time has come that my children are to go and get some uh, education in England, that will definitely happen without any problem. When the time has come that we need to visit England and do one or two things, that will definitely happen. But God has led us and we are definitely happy in the way how God has been leading. Amen. Thank you very much for what you've shared with us. That has been very encouraging. I'm sure everybody that listens to this presentation will be encouraged that we have nothing to fear. We just need to go forward in faith. We need to pray. We need to fast. And we need to lay the plans before God. And God will guide us step by step. He owns everything and he will provide us with everything. He gives us the talents, the abilities to do what we need to do. And he's made us in such a way that we can learn new things. So we're not really limited to only that which we know today, but we can learn new things for tomorrow. Um, Brother Kutai, in closing, do you have any last final words, comments of encouragement or wisdom that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, what I can say to you is Proverbs chapter five, chapter three. I think it's chapter five or chapter three. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Understand this, brothers and sisters. Let's get advice as we get advice. But remember, you are an individual, and God will talk to you as an individual. And understand the voice of God. When, the, when God is talking, understand his voice. When you are familiar with the voice of God, then you definitely see his power. We are here as, uh, on a mission, and our mission is to preach the present truth. As I've said to you, we have got this ministry called the Herald, uh, the, uh, which we on radio called the Great Controversy and the Present Truth. If I would have remained in England, I would not have been able to do that. But I've actually seen that, you know, God has actually led me to do the things that he has preserved me to do. All of us is a mission, all of us is a ministry. Even when we move into the countryside, when we move into the places that we'll be going, we'll be on a mission. Let's cooperate with God and God will actually reveal to us what he intends to do. We have got a lot to share. And uh, one day I'm sure by God's grace, we may get a chance. But in case you want to see some of our presentation, uh, you can always uh, visit the Herald Report Ministry. YouTube channel. And also what we have done for our radio ministry, we have opened another channel called Zai Chigogo. We're going to upload all the audios that we have done on radio. There will be 56 when we finish. We're going to upload all of them. And also we're going to upload all the uh, the, the, the devotionals which we, are do which we are doing so that we can actually continue to share this gospel. So let's continue to pray for one another. Let's mm -hmm. continue to encourage one another. Let's continue to work together. Let's teamwork and do this work. What a capacity which God gives us to, be it uh, distribution of books, be it preaching the gospel, be it helping our neighbor. God has given us an opportunity and this is the chance. May the Lord bless us. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Kudse. And on that note, could you give us the closing prayer? Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the time that you have given us. We've been talking about um, how you have been leading us in the ministries that you have given us. We are your children. We are planning. We are implementing. There are many of us that have been following in different platforms. We pray sincerely that, Lord, you may guide us in the steps that we are in. What capacity we are in. We pray for your power and your grace above all, Lord Jesus. 
we do not have, we here we do not have a lasting city, but we look forward to the one to come. The builder and maker is Christ. Therefore, we pray for wisdom, guidance, direction, and understanding. Bless the leaders of this program. Bless the followers of this program. And we pray that this word may go far and near, that many people will come to the knowledge of the truth and be encouraged as they seek to follow your will in everything. Bless us, we beseech you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Kuzai, for taking the time to share with us your experience of country living and the importance of planning, prayer, and total submission to God. We thank you so much. And don't forget, the next session that we have will be on the 24th of June. So we look forward to meeting with you again on the 24th of June. And until then, may God bless you and keep you. And I trust that you've been inspired by what we've heard this evening. God bless and take care. Thank you again for watching the Journey Planner SDA. Remember to subscribe, like, and share the links to our YouTube and Facebook broadcasts. See you at the next episode.